Hi folks, Dom Lawson here uh, from uh, popular Viking comic, The Metal Hammer, uh, with another one of those Iron Sandwich things wherein I speak into a laptop uh, about something or other uh, for about 15 minutes and then I press the off button. It's brilliant. <coughs> oh dear. Doing this one early in the morning, so apologies if I uh, appear to be somehow traumatised. Um, not really a morning person, not particularly an afternoon person either, to be fair, but uh, there you go. Um, yes, as you can probably tell, I'm not at home. Uh, I'm at my, uh, my lovely girlfriend's place, um, and she is quite a big fan of this band, uh, Slipknot, and that's who I'm going to be talking about. So obviously, uh, she, uh, she's out at the moment. She's gone to work, uh, which means that I can be rude about them without getting cuffed around the back of the head, uh, but I'm not going to be rude about them. I'll be perfectly honest. Well, not particularly anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so the Slipknot album, uh, that's what I'm going to talk to you about, the new one, it's called Five the Grey Chapter, it's out today, um, and to be honest with you, most of you have probably heard it already, because uh, it leaked last week, and also they've been uh, Slipknot have been uh, putting quite a lot of the tracks online, uh, presumably in response to the fact that it's leaked and everyone's helped themselves to it anyway, but um, I have a strong suspicion that um, it'll do pretty well sales-wise anyway, because... Uh, Metal fans do tend to want to buy the actual thing, and uh, with Slipknot, there's you know the usual special editions and all that kind of stuff. So, so do buy it if you're a fan of Slipknot. Um, not least for the reason that it's actually really good. But I, I think um, what I need to, I suppose, what I need to start by addressing is is the concerns that people had in the build-up to this uh, album coming out. Um, excuse me a second. Thanks. Um, obviously, with uh, Paul Gray passing away. Uh, a few years ago, and uh, Joey Jordison being unceremoniously booted out of the band or resigning, whichever one you prefer. Um, it's you know, I guess people's principal worry was you know, uh, Paul and Joey were fundamentally involved in the songwriting on the first four Slipknot albums, and um, and please don't go, oh, it, they've actually made five albums because even the band considered me. Make feed kill repeat to be a demo rather than an album. So let's just let's just go from the basis that the self title was the first album. Um, but obviously, yes, you know, Paul and Joey very very uh, uh, involved in the songwriting. The, the main songwriters in the band. So I guess the concern then was that you know with Corey Taylor and Jim Root kind of taking over uh, the reins in terms of songwriting, that everything will get pushed in that in the direction that their kind of contributions in the past have gone, and of course towards Stone Sour. Um, I mean, I like Stone Sour, but I don't find them particularly exciting. You know, it's it's good, solid, heavy rock stuff with big tunes, and I and I, you know, uh, apart from one fairly dismal album, I quite like their stuff. But it's not, um, it's not exciting in the same way that Slipknot is. And 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 I understand people's concerns that you know the last thing you want is for Slipknot to put an album out and it's full of songs like Snuff and um, Dead Memories. You know, although I love Dead Memories, but you know, Snuff, yeah. <laughs> that album. All Hope Is Gone probably could have been improved with that song disappearing and being replaced by everyone instead, but anyway, there you go. Um, but I personally really liked All Hope Is Gone, so, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, but yeah, so Jim Root has been, uh, you know, uh, obviously, I guess, the primary riff writer on this album, and obviously Corey's input has been probably enhanced since the last record. Um, and uh, I guess people were worried about that. People were worried about Joey Jordison not playing drums on the record. Would it sound the same? You know, he's got a very unique drumming style, um, you know, in much the same way that Dave Lombardo or Nico McBrain, you know, as drummers, if they weren't on Slayer or, well, obviously Dave Lombardo's not going to be on the next Slayer album, but, um, you know, how much does their absence affect the, the overall sound of the album? Um, you know, and how are Slipknot going to cope with the whole, you know, not being nine anymore after all the statements about we will always be nine you know, and all this. Um, you know, I get why people were concerned. And I suppose, in some ways, if, uh, you, kind of, you kind of have to ignore the inevitable cynicism that, that surrounds the release of a, a, a new album by any major band. That's, that's I guess, a fundamental point. You know, because it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're Metallica or Maiden, uh, Machine Head, Slipknot, Lamb of God, any bands, you know, any one of the bit, the bigger bands in our world, um, inevitably all the whiny little shits online are going to go, eh, it's rubbish, mm, I prefer the first album, you know, regardless of, of what the contents of the new album are, um, you have to rise above all that shit, because really who cares what those cunts say, to be honest, you know. Um, but, even, you know, having said that, there is still, I think there was still cause for genuine nervousness about this record. Uh, and then, of course, Slipknot released the negative one, 
and The Devil in I were the t first two tracks that we heard from the album. Uh, the reaction to that I thought was quite interesting. Uh, the negative ones seem to go down pretty well because it sounds very much like an old school Slipknot song. Um, and it's got, I think, one of the fundamental reasons why people were quite positive towards it was the amount of uh, Sid and Craig that you could hear on it. You know, a lot of scratching, a lot of you know weird noises and stuff. That, that were, they were all quite high in the mix, like they were on the first album. That's great. Um, I think that won people over. And then The Devil and I came out. Now, I guess The Devil and I got a very mixed response, and I think primarily because the verses do kind of tend towards a kind of stone sour vibe you know Corey's singing cleanly on them um and you know you, the 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 kind of gap between slipknot and stone sour was very slender at that point on the on the, on that song um personally i really like the song but i know a lot of people aren't that bothered by it and and i guess that's fair enough you know i think two things really that spring to mind about that one Corey taylor is one of the best singers in heavy music, you know, he's got one of the strongest voices, he's a really, really talented singer. Um, why on earth would a band of the Statue of Slipknot stop their, one of their, <laughs> you know, one of their, one of their main members from exploiting his greatest talent? You know, he's a brilliant singer. He sang on, he's probably sings on all the Slipknot albums, but particularly the last two, he's done a lot of clean singing. Um, his voice has improved over the years. It would be mental, I think, not to um, not for him to sing on a Slipknot record. It's not like they've never had singing. You know, people. Some people seem to talk like uh, the extreme, the most extreme bits of Iowa are what Slipknot do, and that's all they've ever done. And it's like, well, no. There's Wait and Bleed, and there's you know um, Left Behind, and there's all kinds of songs, even on the on the earlier albums that that have clean singing on them. And Corey's voice has just got better and more more powerful. You know. So I d that bit on The Devil and I didn't really bother me too much. Uh, the other point, I suppose, um, I've completely forgotten now. What was the other point? Oh, well, don't worry about it. It's probably not important. Um, but um, the other thing is, <clears throat> what exactly do people want from a Slipknot record? Um, I'm wondering if, if it's this rather painful nostalgia thing that seems to dominate people at the moment, where people just bash on about how things used to be in the 90s or, you know, 10 years ago and how things were, you know, I mean, it doesn't seem to be my generation that are bashing on about stuff like that. It seems to be a younger generation who are, um, you know, who want everything to be like it was in 1999. Well, thank Christ it isn't, to be honest. Um, I think if Slipknot made an album that sounded like the first Slipknot album again, with, you know, without any deviation from that kind of blueprint, um, it would be totally redundant, you know. Uh, but also, oh yes, remember what the second point was. The second point was, um, <clears throat> given everything that's happened with with Paul Gray passing away and Joey leaving the band, um, there's no way that Slipknot are not going to make an album if they've decided they want to make one, so that's one. And secondly, you know, who in their right mind is expecting this record to sound exactly like Slipknot did on the previous one or the one before that or the first one or the Bore Iowa? You know, it's like... It's just a, an unrealistic expectation. You, you, bands evolve and mature and change and, and, you know, anyway, regardless, you know, and the best bands always kind of aim to do something different on each record. So even if Paul and Joey were still around in the band, I suspect that this album wouldn't sound a million miles away from how it sounds now. You know, it's the band have been progressing all the way along. Um, so I think people are, you know, going, oh, it doesn't sound like Slipknot. It's like, well, it does, you know, because Slipknot don't just sound like one thing. I mean, all hope is gone. It seemed to be something that people regarded as a as a flaw of uh, All Hope Is Gone was that it was an extremely varied album. You know, he had something like Butcher's Hook that was clearly influenced by Meshuggah, you know. Um, Vendetta, which was very much a kind of thrash track, really, in many ways. It had a, had a kind of thunderous modern testament feel to it. Um, in amongst all the stuff that maybe, you know, ticked the, the boxes that people were, um, uh, would expect Slipknot stuff to, um, to, to tick, you know. Uh, but anyway, so for... Um, four, five, fucking hell, Dom. This is the problem with doing things in the morning. Five, the grey chapter. Um, I heard it first at a listening session a few uh, a month or so ago, and um, heard it a couple of times. And I've got to say, I've got to say, the <laughs> it's a difficult one, really. Um, I mean, I, I'm a massive Slipknot fan. I fucking love Slipknot and, and have always have done. And I was quite nervous about hearing it, but really my, my nervousness disappeared within the first few tracks. Um, the intro, X1X, is... Well, Slipknot have done these before, these kind of extended intro tracks, you know, that are kind of a, like a brooding, menacing kind of uh, uh, way into the, the world of the album. And I think it works brilliantly on this, you know. Um, 
there's some great lyrics in the opening track that kind of sum up how the band must feel about getting back on the horse after losing Paul. You know, um, I think Paul's loss hangs heavily over everything on this record. You know, it's very much the rec uh, a tribute to him. Um, it's very much the story of what what has happened to Corey and to the rest of the band in in the years you know from the moment they heard that Paul died until now you know it's um, it's a it's a brutal and, and an honest record I think and it's probably the most upfront lyrically that they've ever done and again I think that's that's natural you know that's that's to be expected um, but I guess. You know, like it all, but the, I mean, the most devoted fans will probably be pouring over every detail of the lyrics and all the rest of it. But I guess that you know, the the masses of, of people that just kind of like Slipknot or you know, just like the heavy stuff and all the rest of it uh, aren't, aren't going to be that interested in that. Or if they are, not not to the same extent. So what really matters is what do the songs sound like musically. Um, and if you haven't heard the album, and I hope hopefully there'll be at least two people watching this that haven't heard it, um, I don't think there's anything to be concerned about. I actually think this is a you know this album is on a par with All Hope Is Gone um, in terms of quality. I think it's a great record. Um, I don't think it's you know something about this record is it gets better. It grows on me with every listen. Like the first listen, you kind of go, hmm, all right, yeah, it's not bad. Um, by about fourth or fifth listen, I was like, no, actually, this is really fucking good. Um, the opening tracks. The intro aside, Sarcastrophe and AOV. Um, excuse me, a bit windy pops there. Um, yeah, they're proper Slipknot rippers. You know, they they really really boot off. The absence of Joey Jordison is not overly it's not, not overly noticeable. You know, I mean, you're kind of aware that it's somebody else playing the drums, but whoever's playing the drums, if it's Jay Weinberg or, or whoever else, is doing a fucking amazing job, frankly. Uh, and the riffs are killer. You know, there's. There aren't any riffs on this album that make you think, oh dear, that doesn't sound like a Slipknot riff. You know, it's, it's all very true to their sound. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's kind of a bit insulting to the other members of Slipknot to suggest that they could, don't know how to write Slipknot songs. You know, they've been in there for a long time. You know, even Jim Root wasn't on the first album, but, um, you know, he knows what he's fucking doing. Uh, so those two, you know, those two tracks, I particularly like AOV because it kicks off with a really brutal um, kind of Slayer style thrash riff, which is awesome. Um, and there's plenty of other tracks that are really brutal on the album as well. You know, the, the Slipknot Stomp, as I call it, you know, the boom, damn, boom, damn, that thing. Um, that appears numerous times. Uh, there's a lot of blast beats. There's a lot of really fast-paced stuff. There's a lot of slow grinding riffs. The death metal influence is still definitely there. Um, you know, that was always on their stuff. And that's something that, you know, kind of cynics, like, you know, people who are like, oh, they're just commercial. They're a stupid band for children. It's like, you're a stupid band for children. Fuck off. Um, Slipknot have always had a huge chunk of death metal in their sound and, 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 and executed in a credible way and if you don't want to acknowledge that that's fine but you're basically bullshitting if you can't hear it or you don't know anything about death metal which is probably even more likely um, but I guess it's the, the non-brutal tracks that uh, you know I mean the non-brutal tracks that are going to be the talking points I suppose because there's plenty of, like I say plenty of stuff like the negative one and sarcastrophe and AOV um, as a song called Skeptic which has the, the chorus uh, the world will never see another crazy motherfucker like you which is like a really blatant tribute to Paul Gray and that's great I hope they play that one live um, the Custer which has been released of course which is really nasty my, my favourite moment on the album actually comes with Custer uh, which goes into a really weird, warped kind of... It's not even a song, really, just an atmospheric, instrumental, weird thing called Be Prepared for Hell, uh, which then goes into the negative one. I wouldn't be surprised at all, actually, if they have Be Prepared for Hell going over the PA at the shows and then they start with the negative one. That's quite possible, isn't it? Um, but that, that kind of three-track bit is the, the finest bit on the album for me. It's, uh, you know, proper goosebump stuff. Um, but, yeah, there are... There are, ba not ballads, it's wrong to call them ballads, but there are more melodic tracks on the album. Um, and I guess The Devil and I being one of them, even though the, the chorus is really heavy and has a kind of death metal vibe to the, to the rift, uh, you'll either like that or you won't. But I think the the ones the one that maybe people will be looking to and saying, mm, it shouldn't be on a Slipknot album, is a track called Goodbye. Now, I think it's amazing. The, the thing that people, I think the subtlety that people miss the difference between Slipknot and Stone Sour is Stone Sour would do a song like that completely straight. You know, it would be a straight rock song, a straight ballad. With Slipknot, the song itself is quite dark anyway, obviously. You know, it's about the loss of their friend. Um, but in the sonic background, and in the foreground to some extent, there's a lot of interference and effects and weird ambience 
strange noises, uh, and a real sense of something sinister and disturbing going on. And you just don't get that on Stone Sour Records, you know, that's the Slipknot vibe. So they can get away with, you know, like they did Vermilion a few years ago, you know, which is a very, very melodic song. But something about it was was unsettling, you know, and that's the, it's the same with Goodbye on this. There's another track called If Rain Is What You Want, um, which is the closing track on the album, which again is kind of a ballad to some degree. It's a slow song, it's melodic, but there's something just, you know, it's a lot, there's a sense of disquiet lurking um, in the background on the track that, that makes it 100% Slipknot for me. And I don't, I don't find anything on this album incongruous, you know, far less so than Snuff on All, all Hope Is Gone, to be honest. Um, I think the quality of the songs is very high throughout the album. They're all growers, for sure. You know, that um, there are some tracks that aren't quite as immediate as others uh, and some that do take three or four listens to really click. But there's a lot of big hooks. Um, there's a lot of great riffs. There's a lot of awesome, you know, pure Slipknot moments where it's just total chaos. Um, and I think what comes across for me most of all on this record is how passionately the whole thing has been put together. You know, I, th I think uh, it's easy to be cynical about Slipknot, you know, if, you, if you're not a fan, but I'm really not interested in the opinions of people who don't like them. If you do like them, I think this is an album that will grow on you and um, eventually you'll love it. To be honest, you know, I gave it 8 out of 10 in Metalham. You can read my review for a less waffly kind of... Um, <laughs> version of this that actually makes sense and isn't just a hairy dickhead talking rubbish uh, well it is a hairy dickhead talking but just not rubbish um, but yeah I just you know give it a chance if, it, if you're going oh I didn't like the, the songs that I've heard so far that's fine but listen to the album it's one that you need to listen to all the way through it's a very cohesive piece of work I think and um, in terms of you know when you when you look at the circumstances I think you have to be aware of them you can't just go oh well it should be a classic because it's Slipknot you know is it a classic well probably not but in the circumstances, having lost the you know the main songwriters and all the rest of it, what Slipknot have done is make a really fucking good Slipknot record, um, and that for me is enough at this point. I, I sincerely hope that they stick around and make another one in a few years' time, you know, um, because the next one could be really fascinating. Because who knows where they'll go? But um, but yeah, I think this is great. So five, the great chapter by Slipknot. It's out today on Roadrunner Records. Um, it's a belter. If you like Slipknot, you will find some stuff on it that you that you will like. I guarantee you that, and uh, and the rest of it will probably grow on you. So there you go. Um, that was waffle, wasn't it? Terrible. What a load of old rubbish. Um, anyway, there you go. That's the band. Check them out if you haven't before. If you've been living under a rock for the last fifteen years. Um, and yeah, more of this bollocks soon. So uh, have a lovely day, and uh, don't get lost or killed. Cheers. I'm just going to press the button now. There it is. Bye. <laughs>